Nobody heard that? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, growing up, that's what everyone said. I can remember being a grade school kid and we'd cover the presidential election and I was the only blonde haired blue eyed kid, so they always had me play Jimmy Carter. <laughs> Which is funny because when I was six years old, we had a little class election and I voted for Ford because my grandpa was a big fan of Ford and had met Joe Ford. They couldn't believe that the kid playing Carter would vote for Ford. That's <laughs> when I got the school off guard. But there you have it. Uh, certainly the president's, um, I don't know that the president's the most powerful person in the world. They certainly probably have a lot more influence. This is not like a, well, this is where we are today. They get covered the most, they get the most press, the most excitement. A student and I actually did, worked on a research project where we, we looked at uh, France elections and U.S. elections. And French elections weren't covered much in the U.S. That's not surprising. But here was the big surprising thing. France covered the U.S. election more than they covered their own election. Yeah, we did, uh, we did analysis of articles, like how many stories were written. So they wrote more about the U.S. presidential election in 2004 than their own election in 2002. That's just one country, but I thought that was fascinating. Probably because the U.S. president, they've got, they've got lots of hats to wear. This is just the nature of it. They've got to manage, or they're seen as the manager of government. That's, that's in fact what, if you had to look at what a president is supposed to do, that should be the number one and most important function, is you manage the bureaucracy, you manage the executive branch. That's what you should do as president. And you should devote most of your time to this. With wearing more hats, I think presidents have gotten away from that, but if you look at, if you look at the job description, which is in Article 2 of your Constitution, in your books, you're supposed to manage the uh, bureaucracy, manage the executive branch. That's what a president is supposed to do. That should be your first and foremost responsibility. And to be honest, it's also a question you almost never hear. Like, what are your management techniques? How will you show that you have the experience to manage the executive branch? What is your experience level? What are your strategies in doing so? Because that's their number one function. That's why it's at the time. When I say economic administrator, whether we like it or not, presidents are held responsible for how the economy is doing. This goes back to Ronald Reagan. Nah, it goes back further than that. But Ronald Reagan's the most uh, public example of that, where he made his campaign a referendum on Jimmy Carter's administration, borrowing from an Illinois governor, Big Jim Thompson, who used this line. Uh, Ronald Reagan used the phrase, uh, are you better off than you were four years ago? And by better off, we tend to think of that as economic. So voters concluded in 1980 that they weren't better off than they were in 1976, so they voted for Ronald Reagan, they voted for a change. Four years later, the same question was asked and voters felt like they did better in 1984 than they were doing in 1980. You would hear phrases like Reaganomics, Bushonomics, Clintonomics. Bushonomics again. <laughs> Obamaonomics. Whatever the case is, the presidents are seen as the administrator of the economy, whether that's They do appoint uh, members of the Federal Reserve who have powers over interest rates. Uh, they don't control the budget. Like They always have somebody who submits a, pro a budget proposal which never gets accepted. But regardless whether, whether we like them or not, uh, the presidents are held accountable for how the economy is doing. If it happens on your watch, it's your fault. If the economy's doing well, it's your success. That's just how it works. Obama was re-elected largely because the economy, though not fully recovered, was better than it was in 2008. You would have to use a lot of creative economic statistics to show otherwise. Now, you know, to, I understand what the Mitt Romney administration, or their uh, 
their campaign was trying to do, they were trying to say, well, actually, the economy has not gotten better. And they were trying to cite data from when uh, the election was held. But of course, most of the deepening unemployment happened. The stock market crashed in November, December. Most of the unemployment was late December, early January. However you spun it, it was a mistake for Romney to do that. He should have focused on the budget deficit, which certainly got much worse. That's what I would have advised Mitt Romney. That's why I told all the Republican groups that I spoke to in 2012. I was like, focus on the debt. Don't focus on the economy. It's going to get better, and it's going to burn you if you make it a referendum. Republicans did, and it was not that much better. But it was better. We forget the last time a president was reelected where unemployment was 6% or above, and it was like, I think when Obama was reelected, it was like 5.9, 5.8. The last time a president was reelected with an unemployment rate higher than that, does anybody know? FDR. Bush, FDR. <clears throat> the answer will shock you. You'll never get it. No, I mean, sooner or later, you'll list it. <laughs> I'm listing all the presidents. <laughs> okay. Ronald Reagan. In 1984, unemployment was 7% when he was reelected. How could he be reelected with the unemployment rate? 7%, which is higher than it is today. Anybody know what it is today? Oh, five. Take a look. I love when you bring the laptops. Let me know what it is today. <coughs> is it 5%? Is it 4%? It could have an impact on the election, so take a look at it. Well, unemployment had gotten, by 1982, it was up to 12%. We had a deep recession. Unemployment rose. Uh, we had a recession that began in, in 1980. Five. We had inflation. It's five even. Yeah, if it gets below five, that, that'll be a big... Well, if you're a Democrat, you'll tap those numbers and you're a Republican, you'll say, well, it doesn't show the real unemployment numbers. After all, does anybody know what unemployment read? How they measure unemployment? No, it's really complicated. Actually, it's a pretty simple one. I mean, you're right, like the actual statistical thing, but the, do you know how they get the data? How do they figure out somebody's unemployed? Yeah. Basically, you file for unemployment insurance. That's how they calculate unemployment rates. Could it be higher than 5%? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the, some people just drop out of the market. They realize I have no chance of getting a job at work. They've searched for a while and haven't found anything. Or they're living with their folks. They're just not saying, okay, I'm just not going to collect unemployment insurance. You could work in an informal economy, you know, where you don't declare such stuff. You mow a bunch of lawns and stuff to get by. Yeah. Is the unemployment rate higher than 5%? Oh, yeah. It's almost always higher than the actual unemployment numbers. Definitely the case. But see, Ronald Reagan, in fact, when unemployment got to 12%, Ronald Reagan's approval ratings dropped below anything Obama has ever seen. They were down to 35% in 1982. And actually, the Republican Party took it on the chin in 1982. They lost a bunch of seats. They lost a bunch of governor's races. It was called midterm elections. And Ronald Reagan actually told Nancy Reagan just before Christmas, oh, I'm just not going to run. He would just be a one-term president. He, he wouldn't even try to run again. He was kind of old. Well, the economy came roaring back in 1983. So unemployment dropped significantly from 12% 12, 12 to 7%. So even though the unemployment rate overall was still high, people saw the country moving in the right direction. And so he was rewarded with another four years. Do you see how that works? You realize, I'm trying to make this as nonpartisan as possible. I mean, Bill Clinton uh, won a strong re-election in 1996 because the economy was, was doing much better than it was in 1992. For Bush, the economy was, was doing, uh, I would say the economy was doing better in 2004, so he got re-elected. Like I said, the economy was marginally better in 2012, but it was just good enough for Obama to get re-elected. That's just usually how it goes. Presidents get re-elected when the economy's doing well, 
they or their party lose when the economy is not doing well. We had a very small, mild recession in 2000, but it was probably just enough to deny Al Gore the White House. It's kind of bad time for, for a reason. You don't want a recession to begin like during the election season. It wasn't. It was. It was one of our weakest, mildest recessions since World War, the end of World War II, but still not as good. It had people concerned. That and Bill Clinton's actions in the White House probably also cost Al Gore the uh, White House too. You're supposed to be international diplomat, commander in chief, and you're also perform something called symbolic functions. This is something that you don't see in a lot of other countries. We're one of the only countries where our symbolic leader is an elected leader. I know what you're thinking right now. How could it be any different, Dr. Jerez? Well, can you think of a case where you have a nonpartisan, non-elected, symbolic leader of a country? Whoa, there you go. Queen of England, exactly. You don't vote for kings and queens. <laughs> right? And that person performs, uh, most times, that, that's why they keep royalty around, by the way. I don't know if you know this. Some of it is tradition, but some of it is so that people can't exploit the symbols for elective gain. That's why they keep a queen of England, a king of England, why you Holland, most European countries, most of them, they're not, you know, they're like, well, the monarch doesn't hold any real functions. They don't run government, but they're there to represent the country. Same thing for Spain, same thing for, uh, I mean, there are a couple of Middle East countries where they're actually kingdoms. I get that. Like Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Morocco. But yeah. In most, in, in most of these countries, they're not even really technically constitutional monarchies. The monarch only exists for symbolic functions. Now, some countries, they don't like royalty. They don't want royals around. Maybe their royals were bad, like Germany's emperors, the Kaisers. So nobody wanted them back. But here's what they do. They create a special position who will hold the symbolic functions who will represent the country as a whole. Germany and Israel have presidents. They are as much a figurehead as European royalty, but they're there to represent the country as a whole. Usually it's someone, they've been around in politics for years, they're seen as, they're seen as very bipartisan, they're not affiliated with one part or the other, pretty centrist, pretty neutral. William Well would be a good example if we had one. In fact, America has two, technically. After he left the, um, after both left the presidency, George Herbert Walker Bush, that means Bush Sr., and Bill Clinton, sort of going around trying to raise funds for uh, the victims of the Indonesian tsunami. Do y'all remember that? It was in like 2004 where a bunch of people drowned. It was a big tsunami, big, uh, everybody kept using tsunami all of a sudden in language. Uh, to to uh, take care of the, uh, was it Haiti when they had the earthquake? So our two ex-presidents, one Democrat, one Republican, held symbolic functions. And Bush Jr. picked up where Bush Sr. left off. If I go to Selma for the anniversary of the Selma march, both Bush and Clinton were there to show sort of some bipartisan unity. So America actually created two symbolic leaders. Instead of having one, we have two. And this goes back, believe it or not, even though they ran elections against each other, uh, the Bush family and Clinton family have always been uh, relatively close to each other. They don't hate each other's guts. It's not like last night's debate where they didn't shake hands. They sort of moved toward each other and then they just moved away from each other. Is that the first time in a long time that's happened? I've never seen anything like that. I didn't think so. I've seen it in lower races. You'll get the, uh, you'll get the, uh, ooh, you know, FSU versus Miami. Sort of thing. <laughs> There's been like the non-handshake where somebody offers a handshake and the other person doesn't do it. Seriously. That happened in Texas. There was a Texas Republican senator 
who did not shake hands with the Democrat congressman challenging him. The Democrat had a slight lead. And everyone started criticizing, oh, how dare you not shake hands? Well, the Democrat congressman had talked about the Republican senator's wife being involved in some financial dealings. So he appeared on TV and he said, in Texas, when a man insults a, another man's wife, you don't shake hands with them. I feel like we're almost there. You understand the whole symbolic function? Give you an example. I, don't, I know y'all probably weren't alive then. Were they anybody alive in 1995? In this class? Okay, one or two. All right, so you probably don't. Do you remember growing up hearing about the Oklahoma City bombing? 168 people killed by a domestic terrorist. Oh, it was a truck, a whole truck bomb full of fertilizer. It was a big fertilizer bomb. The guy drove a truck right up to the entrance of the building, <clears throat> took off, jumped in a car. The whole thing blew up. It's not somebody from the Middle East. It was someone from the U.S. It had nothing to do with the Middle East. 168 people killed. Most of the fatalities were kids in the daycare center because the truck was parked right underneath. And given that this person scoped out the area, probably knew there was a daycare center right above it. Most of the images were a firefighter uh, taking a uh, mangled uh, kid's body out of that. At the time, Bill Clinton's approval ratings were... I don't know, they weren't, they were kind of where Obama's have been most of this administration. 45% like and 45% don't, 10% can't make up their mind. But after that, when Bill Clinton goes over to Oklahoma, vows to catch the criminals responsible for that, hugging the grieving survivors, his approval rating jumped over 50%. It never went below 50% again. That's the power of symbolic, you know, because we don't have someone who represents the, you know, the country as a whole other than this elected leader. That's just, that's just how it works. In France, it's the same thing. The highest, the highest symbolic leader also is an elected leader too. So it can be used for political gain as well. Does that make sense? I mean, Hurricane Matthew went through. Anybody affected by that? You'll have relatives who come on up here. Or did y'all, some people have to play a game early <laughs> on Thursday night. First Thursday night football game. Hey, y'all think they would bring that to the college campus? That'd be kind of fun, Thursday night football. Like start meeting around 7.30. Y'all look at me, but I remember when Thursday night football was seen, most people were like, nobody's gonna watch a game on Thursday night. That was a big deal in college. Oh, man. But presidents going to area to help out with natural disasters, that's a big boost for your campaign. And if you blow it, then it also works against you if you're not there to perform those symbolic functions. If I think of a case in history where that happened, where a natural disaster struck and the president was nowhere to be found, or a terror attack. You get the advantages of the symbolic function, but if you aren't there to perform them, you'll be held accountable. Which is why presidents from from now on uh, they'll have to be rushing rushing to the scene. Now sometimes they're coordinating with locals to say, you know, is it okay to go in if I come in with all my bodyguards and security and other people, am I going to be disruption or so? You know, that's, I think most people are understandable. But if you're not showing up for several days or so, then there's a problem. You also have a series of presidential powers. Now, most of these are spelled out in the Constitution. Uh, you get to do a lot of other things too, right? Most of these are pretty self-explanatory. Access to the media, popularity, you're the best known person in the world. 
you can issue uh, executive orders. Now, executive orders, of course, could be rescinded. During the Republican debate in 2015, all the de debates, everyone was saying, on day one, I'm going to rescind everything, every one of Obama's executive orders. And then people had to go through to see, well, wait, some of these might be good ones. <laughs> Make them your own, who knows? But nevertheless, you know, they, they're presidential directives. They don't have, they don't always have the force of law. Sometimes they have. Can you think of the most famous uh, executive order? American history, my American experience students uh, talked about today. It was not a Congress law. It was president issued an executive order. Was it the one with the five million legal immigrants? Oh, I don't mean it really, but yeah, that's a good example of a contemporary executive order. Sure. Uh, well, that was actually a Gulf of Tonkin resolution. That was a congressional resolution. That one passed 98 to 2. If you take my international politics class, so we'll cover that. Anybody think of one? Well, maybe you didn't hear it was an, an executive order, but the Emancipation Proclamation. You ever heard of that one? 1862? I should give you the year. That's an executive order issued by Abraham Lincoln saying all slaves in southern states would be free. Notice he didn't free them in northern states because he didn't want like Kentucky or Missouri to rebel or Maryland to go south. But he issued them in all the states that seceded or rebelled said, okay, you guys no longer have any rights to have slaves. But what most people don't also realize is in that executive order, he said that uh, blacks would have the same rights as whites. Very revolutionary. But it was also designed to encourage most of the slaves to leave the plantations. So they made sure the word spread throughout the south of this. And that's exactly what happened. Incidentally, in 1864, more African Americans served in the Northern Army than probably existed in terms of General Lee's army of Northern Virginia, like those who were able to fight in 1864. So you don't think it makes a big difference. When you add 200,000 reinforcements, and again, that's bigger than the army you face. Yeah, it was fatal for the South. Now, several Southern generals said, free the slaves, give them land, let them fight for us. It did not go so well for those generals who suggested that. You have a series of appointments, and you also have your White House staff. This is where you get, uh, anybody ever heard of a TV show called The West Wing? This is what sort of, The West Wing is like the TV show because if they called it executive office of the president, nobody would watch it. Maybe if they just called it the office. Right. This is who the president gets to a point. They don't have to be approved by Congress. This is basically the White House team. The executive office of the president. These are the people who you get to a point who work directly for you. They're your advisors. Congress can't say, nah, we don't like your press secretary. Well, I mean, they can say that, but they can't like do anything. So that's what you have. The chief of staff to organize your schedule, the press secretary to speak uh, to the media, and your chief attorney, because presidents are always getting sued. This is, well, presidents always get sued. You get your budget director. Now, they don't control the budget. What they do is they set out the president's ideas. The president almost always submits a budget saying, this is how I think the budget should look. Congress looks at it and laughs. <laughs> Why? Yeah, because Congress controls spending. You can go to your constitution for that. The presidents are saying, here's how I would like the budget. They never get approved. Even at the height of his popularity, Ronald Reagan would submit his budget plan to Congress and he got one person to vote for it. That was uh, Jack Kemp, a uh, former San Diego Chargers and Buffalo Bills football player and congressman from New York. He was a big Reagan fan. Everybody else voted against it, even in his own party. Why? Anybody here give up power willingly? If you're a Republican in Congress or a Democrat in Congress, 
They're going to have the president tell you what to do. If you have the power over the budget, you set the budget, not the president. The presidents have basically choices. Veto the congressional budget or approve of it. That's all your choice. You can tell people what you like, but that's about all you can do. So when you hear about so-and-so's budget director, it, it just sets out what the president would like to see. It doesn't have any real effect. More power actually goes to the National Security Council. We get a small group of individuals who are kind of your foreign policy advisors. Most people ignored them, except during the Reagan administration, because members of the National Security Council uh, were trying to end what was called a uh, Iran-Contra affair. You ever heard of this? It was a scandal in the 80s. You all know how that worked? Well, Ronald Reagan said we wouldn't negotiate with terrorists, but we were negotiating with a terror group, Hezbollah, and, well, we couldn't directly talk to them, so we talked to their backers in Iran and Syria. You get to see how this stuff kind of sticks around. And in fact, we had, a, we had economic sanctions on Iran. Nobody could trade with Iran. But Iran was fighting a war with Iraq. We didn't like either country. So we sold weapons to both sides. We weren't supposed to sell them to Iran, but Iran needed them. We just basically wanted both sides, both of our enemies, to beat each other up. That's all we wanted. But the money we made from the sales went to rebels in Nicaragua, a Central American country. The uh, communists were in charge of Nicaragua, and so we supported rebels. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, how could that be bad? Well, Congress had passed a law saying we couldn't give money to Nicaraguan rebels. And they used the money of these secret sales because, I mean, you already made these secret sales. You couldn't tell Congress you were selling stuff to Iran. That would look bad. So what are you supposed to do with the money? Oh, let's give it to Nicaraguan rebels. So it kind of violated uh, the Iran sanctions and it kind of violated uh, what's called the Congressional Boland Amendment, which said you can't send military weapons. Now, they said you could send humanitarian aid to Nicaraguans who fled the conflict, but you can't sell military stuff. And so we did. You ever heard the name Oliver North? Does this mean anything to you? I met him when I was in, uh, when I was in uh, Nothing more than just like shake his hand. He was at a campaign appearance. I was wearing a slipper. I remember that because I broke my ankle playing basketball. <laughs> and so, so I was on crutches when I met him. So I, and I, I, my foot swelled up so darn big, I couldn't get a real shoe on. So I just had a slipper because he you had know, slippers more. The last time. Everybody at the table there was a Texas congressman. There were all these Republicans at the table. They saw him with crutches and they said, How did you hurt your ankle? Skiing? And I said, No, I was playing basketball. And they all looked at me like, What the heck is that? Yeah, I went to my hot tops, grabbed a rebound. Somebody from Fellowship of Christian Athletes came up right behind me. My foot came down on his. Are you a hooper? I was. <laughs> Yeah. It actually would have been better if I broke it completely instead I just stretched a little bit heck out of everything. Big old ankle that semester. So. And the sad thing was that was in like the first five minutes of the game and I was so happy I grabbed a rebound. Uh, so I was on crutches. This is before the Americans with Disabilities Act. Let me tell you, college campuses used to be a lot harder for people on crutches. Yeah, everything had to be stairs. I swear, I was almost tearing up the first time. <laughs> it went to all, all four of my classes, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, how can you live doing this? Things are like this. But yeah, Oliver North and his national security team were going around Congress, and so they got in trouble. Incidentally, anybody heard of the ACLU? American Civil Liberties Union? Anybody ever heard of them? Most people are like, wow, that liberal group. You'll see signs where people will write ACLU and a big Ghostbuster slash through them. But they actually defended Oliver North, and uh, most of the charges against him were uh, dropped or received. What do you do? You do get a lot of, uh, you do get some powers. The president gives a State of the Union address. Everybody watches that. Hopefully it never turns out like that Keeper Sutherland show. What's that called? Designated surviving. Designated surviving. You know how they always have like 
one person can't be at the State of the Union. They have all Congress there. They have all cabinet members there, except for one. Everybody's looking around, wait, who's not here? <laughs> Just in case something catastrophic happens. So the keeper something wouldn't be. What is his uh, job anyway? I think he's just a cabinet member. He's a cabinet member. I just didn't know if they said, like, is he held in human services or something? Kiefer? But yeah, every year the president gives a prime time State of the Union address where they list all the stuff that they do, that they want to do. They list previous accomplishments. It's a big prime time affair. It gets everyone thinking that the president <coughs> controls the economy and controls all policy when in fact they don't. What you really need is you, you, need the, uh, you need the leader of both political parties to say, here's what we plan. That would probably be more realistic. But that's what, con that's what the Constitution says. Got to give a State of the Union address. Sometimes the president doesn't give it in a big speech. I remember Jimmy Carter, his last year, he just like, in 1981, he wrote out the State of the Union Address and just sent it on in. Well, he'd already been defeated for re-election, so. Anybody know what horse trading, arm twisting is? I told you, Congress gets to pass laws, right? Doesn't mean the president, doesn't mean the president is powerless. Whether we have President Donald Trump, President Hillary Clinton, or President Gary Johnson, they can, they, they've got enough power that they can, uh, especially with the threat of veto, that they can sometimes twist some arms. They can uh, work out some deals. Anybody watch that, uh, what's that, House of Cards? Right, where they have presidents and... And they're trying to like trying to figure out how to like dole out favors, how to threaten other people. You know, Vladimir Putin watches that show just to get ideas about how Congress works. I agree, Harrison. You have to shake your head. So it's Hollywood, but certainly some horse trading goes on. Hey, want to hear a great story? Anybody heard of LBJ, President Lyndon Baines Johnson? Yeah. I had a class. Okay. He was, he was easily the most entertaining president we ever had. I think even if Donald Trump wins, he, he had some tough competition to be more entertaining than uh, President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Johnson was sort of a colorful, earthy character, very crude in some of his methods. And he was the closest thing we had to Frank Underwood, the person who House of Cards is based on. Because he knew how to, he built up a lot of power in Congress, so he had a lot, he did more horse trading and arm twisting than anyone else. Here's the story. There's a, oh, there's an Idaho senator named Frank Church. Frank Church is actually, I don't know how the hell he got elected in Idaho, because it's one of the most conservative states, but Frank Church was fairly liberal, especially on foreign affairs. Frank Church is one of the people who voted against that Vietnam resolution you were talking about, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. He's one of the only ones who opposed it. And he was always a critic of uh, our Vietnam policy. So one day, LBJ called him into his office when he's president and says, where the hell do you get your ideas about Vietnam? Frank Church was from Walter Lippmann. Now you probably don't know who Walter Lippmann is. Walter Lippmann was like a columnist for the New York Times that everybody read. That's like what I would like to be eventually. <laughs> by Collins. Not quite there yet. So he said, I get my ideas from Vietnam, about Vietnam from Walter Lippmann. So LBJ goes, oh yeah? Next time you want a dam built in Idaho, you just go ask Walter Lippmann. Now Walter Lippmann's a famous columnist, but he sure as hell doesn't have the money to build dams. The idea is that I thought you'd find that money. <laughs> it shows the power of the president. He was pretty much saying, like, you know, you won't get anything done in your state unless you follow what the hell I say. That eh. happens. Presidents also get a honeymoon period. No, not that honeymoon. Anybody know what the honeymoon period is? <laughs> Once you get in office, 
it kind of, it's all, the reason I call it honeymoon is like right after you get married, you're in this like blissful state. Nothing gets you down. For our honeymoon, we camped up in Virginia. Our campsite was flooded. It was like underwater, the one that they gave us. No problem. We just picked up our tent and moved it to a drier spot, and the folks at the campgrounds let us stay. Everything's happy. We kept having a couple next to us. They'd come over every night while we're in our tent. They're like, hey, you want to come on over and roast marshmallows? We're like, no, we're on our honeymoon. <laughs> hey, you want to shoot some baskets? Oh, honeymoon thing. <laughs> It's like the Griswolds from vacation, right? <laughs> nice folks, but honey. Nice blissful. You don't get any arguments, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's first couple months of your presidency. If you want to get something done, you better do it during your honeymoon period. <laughs> Where everybody likes the president. Not after <coughs> not after a while. After a while, then you start getting blamed for stuff, and then your approval could be good as well. Anybody ever want to see? Um, anybody ever want to see honeymoon period? See if it works. Let's see if I got. Want to see some honey? You want to see if the honeymoon period applies? Y'all ready? This is data from the same sources from the Gallup polls. The idea of the honeymoon period is that you get elected, and then over time, so the theory is your presidential approval ratings will go down. So as time goes on, your independent variable, your popularity decreases. So what do you notice? JFK was really popular. Yeah, JFK, yeah believe it or not, most, I, I'd always been told JFK was really popular. He was very unpopular until he was shot. Then everybody liked him. Well, he was actually a little more popular. He started off about 70% approval rating. Now, he was about 55% approval rating when he was assassinated, and he rose back up to 70% numbers. But yeah, that's an example of yeah, a slight decline over time. What do you notice about General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Republican from the 50s? Similar? Yeah. This the the black line is 51 percent, by the way. So what do we notice? People like him, close to 70, at times over 70. Now you could go up and down, that's that's what reality shows. What do you notice about Harry Truman? Poor oh, guys. <laughs> up and down, up and down. <laughs> You know, good things would happen, bad things would happen. That's just how it goes. Look at LBJ. Started very high, 75%. This is when he announces he's not running for re-election. Then people thought he was kind of okay, so he ended, he ended on a high note, but only because he wasn't running again. Richard Nixon? Not as popular as the others, but oh boy, after the water deed stuff, look what happened then. Gerald Ford. 
This is re-election time. Gerald Ford almost made it back to 50%. He got more popular after uh, after the election. And see, Jimmy Carter started off close to 70%. Look, all the way down to about 30%. I know what you're thinking. What the heck is this? That's the next point I'm going to tell you about. One of our students, the first time we ever had a student present at a regional conference, one of our students uh, presented up in Atlanta at a conference about what was known as Desert One. Desert One was an attempt to rescue our, uh, hostages in the rain. It was a failure. It was like Mississippi State against Al Auburn. It, didn't, it was a failure. <laughs> didn't go so well. Yeah, some of our helicopters failed, and one of the only helicopters that was working uh, crashed into one of our airplanes when we decided to abort the mission and take off. So a bunch of Delta Force people got killed, and about 12, uh, 12 to 15 people died, and we didn't rescue anybody. The problem was we were using Navy helicopters in the middle of a sandstorm. If you've ever been in a sandstorm, I've been in those, it's not fun. But believe it or not, even though the mission failed, President Carter's approval ratings jumped up. How could that be? Any thoughts? Solomon, what do you think? How can a failure, how can a failure lead to higher approval ratings? Nobody got rescued. People died. Seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? I mean, depends on the situation, I guess. I think what it was is hostages have been taken, and it showed that, you know, a lot of times the president, you know, you're at least trying. That's one theory. But remember the symbolic functions. You know, meeting with the grieving uh, family members of those who were lost in the rescue operation. Go ahead, Sidney. All publicity is good publicity? <laughs> in some ways, I mean, yeah, it was... Our efforts were mostly to free the hostages were behind the scenes in negotiations, so it didn't look like we were doing it. So this looked like something public. And at least people thought, well, we're trying to do something. But as the hostages stayed put in Iran and the economy worsened, it's approval rate. Right I think the lesson that we can get from, uh, I mean, you look at it, Reagan, Reagan started off with fairly good approval ratings. They went up after uh, the attempted assassination. But remember what I said about how low his approval ratings fell because of the economy. They recovered in time for the election. Dropped down during the Iran-Contra scandal. They managed to get back up over 50% approval rating by the end of his term. Bill Clinton, a similar story, up and down generally ended on a high note. Both Bushes seem to embody the honeymoon period where your popularity declines dramatically over time. Where's two thousand? Right there, I'm sure. There you go. It's the highest approval rating Gallup ever had for a president. If you think about it, 9-11 wasn't some success. That was a big failure, wasn't it? That's why I asked you about Desert Warren. But remember, they're an opportunity for the president. The symbolic functions. Remember how I told you about all those things. You know, when you're rallying the country together, there's also a burst of nationalism. Everyone had American flags up all over, all over the United States. We had some uh, some neighbors of ours from uh, Yemen, which is a uh, Middle Eastern country on the Arabian Peninsula. And after our neighbors pretty much went over, and we kind of lived in, in a very diverse area, but we had a guy who was a Marine, his wife was British, he met her serving over there. We had a guy who was in the NRA, a couple of us. But it was, I mean, you know, they, they went over, they pretty much let everyone in the neighborhood know that nobody was to go after this guy from Yemen and his family, who were terrified after 9-11, because one of the hijackers was from Yemen. And he was so moved that they went out to guard him because I everybody knew each other. We'd all get together for Christmas, for potlucks. It was a really kind of cool neighborhood. Our neighborhood was called the Little UN. He was so moved by that that he put a big old flag outside for the United States. And his wife was tearfully telling me how grateful they were for the 
these uh, for these political conservatives who stuck up for But over time, you know, with the um, with the Iraq War, with Hurricane Katrina's response, with the Great Recession, his approval ratings declined dramatically. The, just like a lot of other presidents, once you're out of office, your numbers can kind of come back up. So, although those are some freakishly weird paintings. But you see how this works? So this is the honeymoon period. You get to see examples. Of doesn't fit into a scientific law, but generally on the right track. Obviously, with checks and balances, Congress and the President, see what he said. I don't know if he, we may not agree. We just, we've always grown up with separation of powers. We've always grown up with checks and balances. We don't realize that we have an independent executive branch. The number of countries that have an independent executive branch that isn't a dictatorship is a very small number. Many democracies have a parliamentary system where the, they don't have a separation of powers. The executive branch and the legislative branch are unified. Our neighbors to the north, Canada, have this. Britain, most West European countries. If there's a democracy today, the majority of them are parliamentary democracies. Those presidential systems that aren't dictatorships on paper eventually move into them, like Russia. I mean, you can look at independent, independent executive branch, the number of cases. Let's see who are Democratic. Uh, France, <coughs> a couple Latin American countries, South Korea, and they didn't used to be. That's a more recent change in the 1980, late 1980s, early 90s. And that's about it. Independent, executive branch, and democratic. You could probably count on, on two sets of hands. That's about it. Because most times, when you're independent, executive branch, you morph into a dictatorship. Other countries, they have no separation of powers. There's no checks and balances. Remember that. That's why we had an American Revolution. Because the people, you know, two branches were against us. There was no check on power. Parliament became a dictatorship. So, I saw a post from a friend of mine from another country last night when, uh, obviously, everyone did y'all this? Did y'all watch the debate and get on Facebook and go, what the pacifier? <laughs> Sorry, in order to keep swearing when we have our kids, we couldn't say WTF, so we just said WTP or pacifier. <laughs> just so we wouldn't swear in front of our kids. Heck, they were watching it. First thing I came out, getting all dressed up, even though it's a, it's a fall break for my kids, my son came right up to me and goes, Dad, Donald Trump said he's putting Hillary Clinton in jail if he gets elected. <laughs> so kids watch. After watching for a little bit, my daughter, uh, what, what some of the debate subjects were, she just like went to work with me to watch Supernatural. <laughs> she was disgusted with it. But this person posted, they said, yeah, I understand all of you Americans, you're angry about the 2016 election. Be grateful that you have elections. Be grateful that you have that freedom. Not all of us do. I would say that a majority of, uh, I mean, at one point in the late 1990s, we actually had a majority of the world's people who were under a free system. You can't quite make that call anymore. It's actually, since the, since the uh, late 1990s, you've had a lot of countries where they have elections, but they're definitely very unfree elections. You don't have checks and balances. You don't have separation of powers. Can I leave you with uh, can I leave you with one Ronald Reagan quote? He said, "Freedom's never more than one generation away from, uh, from disappearing." Like, 
It doesn't take much to kill freedom in a free society. It's not like it takes a hundred years or so. You disappear in a fairly short period of time. Keep that in mind. Great to see it. Uh, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.